Coming up today, President Park Geun-hye is on a mission in Mexico as she looks to boost Korea's economic and diplomatic presence in one of Latin America's biggest markets. Campaigning for the April 13th general election reaches fever pitch with just nine days remaining before Koreans head to the polls. The race itself could be the tightest in years. First North Korea slams the latest UN sanctions slapped on the regime for its nuclear missile provocations. It also says the US should do more to ease tension on the peninsula. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Monday, the 4th of April. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Arirang TV. Thank you ever so much for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We are going to start with the latest on President Park and Hay's trip to Latin America. And the South Korean leader has been spending her second full day in Mexico promoting Korean culture and Hallyu content. But she saved some time for some sightseeing as well. Her first major political appointment will come on Monday local time when she holds summit talks with her Mexican counterpart, Ao Song Ji Son, who is travelling with the president, files this report from Mexico City. The 3,200 seats in Mexico's Metropolitan Theatre are all taken by local fans of Korean culture. Korea's traditional song, Arirang, is remixed into a medley and co-performed by a contemporary Kugak orchestra and a local band. A dynamic Taekwondo demonstration excites athletes and fans in a country with two million practitioners. The fun reaches its peak with a performance by K-pop superstars, Infinite. After an hour filled with harmony, President Buck greeted the local audience in Spanish. <laughs> President Bach's cultural diplomacy also took her to Mexico's National Museum of Anthropology, where she appreciated the rich legacy of Aztec and Maya civilizations and vowed greater cooperation and exchanges between the two countries' museums. President Buck's focus will now shift to business as she sits down for summit talks on Monday with her Mexican counterpart, Enrique Peña Nieto. In an interview with Mexican newspaper El Universal, she said a free trade pact between the two countries will be a win-win for both and a much efficient and faster way to boost trade than the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Mexico is putting more priority in. Song Jisun, Arirang News, Mexico City. Now, boosting economic ties is a major focus of President Park and Hay's trip to Mexico. She's accompanied by representatives from 140 Korean companies and business entities, the largest delegation of its kind to date. For a closer look at the president's latest diplomatic foray to Latin America, Kim Min Ji reports. One of the motivating factors for President Park and its trip to Mexico, aside from political and cultural diplomacy, is the potential of the market. Mexico is the second largest market in Latin America after Brazil and known for its abundant mineral resources and relatively cheap labor. Its GDP currently stands at 1.2 trillion US dollars, growing 2.5 percent on year in 2015, and growth projected in the 4 percent range by 2018. More importantly, Mexico is part of multiple free trade deals, which could provide a bridge for Korean companies to cross into the Americas. Mexico is part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and a member of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Therefore, establishing production facilities in Mexico will make it easier to export to the U.S. On top of that, the Korean government sees ample opportunities in the market, as Mexico is pursuing large-scale investment in a national infrastructure project worth around $600 billion, involving various sectors, including energy, health and urban development. During summit talks with her Mexican counterpart, Enrique Peña Nieto, President Bach is expected to discuss ways to establish cooperation in new industries such as energy, health care and cultural content. There will be growing demand for development in social overhead capital and energy sectors in Mexico. 
Korea can become a strong partner because it does not produce a drop of oil, yet has top-notch oil refining facilities. Korea and Mexico first established diplomatic ties in 1962 and became strategic partners in 2005. Mexico is Korea's largest trade partner in Latin America, with bilateral trade volume reaching roughly $14.4 billion last year. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Now, in the rest of the day's news, and election ballots are being printed today, nine days ahead of Korea's 20th general election on April 13th. This means it will no longer be viable for the parties to strike any alliances. From this point on, as the candidate's registration, or resignation rather, would not be reflected on the ballot slip. The day before the ballots hit the printing presses is considered the deadline for potential alliances because the names on the ballots are set. Now, with early voters able to cast their ballots from this Friday, party leaders have been attempting to lock down further support all around the country. Leaders from the ruling Senate Party are campaigning in North and South uh, Gyeongsangdo provinces on this Monday, regions with a strong affiliation with the Conservative Party. The leadership of the main opposition Minju Party of Korea is back in, in the Seoul metropolitan area on this Monday after spending the weekend around its home turf of Honam in the southwest and on Jeju Island. And Chol Su, co-chair of the newly created minor opposition People's Party, is back in Seoul where he hopes to secure support in his electoral district of no one and all around the capital. Now, with just over a week to go before Election Day, Korea's election watchdog estimates there are still millions of people who have yet to make up their mind on who to vote for. The National Election Commission says that among the 42 million eligible voters, 7.5 million are swing voters with no specific party affiliation. It cited the recent factional strife within the ruling Senudu party and the opposition bloc's failure to form alliances as the main reasons the growing number of undecided voters. A poll conducted by Gallup Korea from March 29th through the 31st also showed that 72% said they would definitely vote on election day. The biggest voting bloc in terms of age are those in their 60s or older. 23% of all registered Korean voters followed by voters in their 40s. Now, some of the biggest election battlegrounds are likely to be in the heart of the party's traditional strongholds in the south of the country. Latest polls indicate voters are having a tough time choosing between, on the one hand, a major change, and on the other, maintaining the status quo. Shin Semin reports. Regions with once strong political affiliations have become open battlegrounds due to unexpected political circumstances and what candidates intend to offer their traditional strongholds. A key regional battle is taking place in the country's third biggest city, Daegu, which is President Park Geun-hye's political home turf. Independent candidates, most of them who left the ruling Senate party in the wake of the party's factional strife, are all seeking re-election. Leading the pack is Yoo Sung Min, who quit the ruling camp after the Conservative Party dropped him from the candidate nomination list due to their clashing political stances. Polls show locals might be eyeing a change. It's been too long. It's about time we had something different in this region. Still, it'll better be the ruling party. I'm rooting for them to win. Considered one of the main opposition party's key strongholds in the Honam region, six different candidates are facing off in Gwangju's Seogubi district. But the race is expected to come down to two liberal candidates, newcomer Yang Hyangja of the main opposition Minju Party of Korea and the political heavyweight and a co-chair of the minor opposition People's Party, Chun jung -bae. Yang, a former high flyer at Samsung Electronics, became the first female executive in Korea's biggest conglomerate in 2012. She hopes her success story will resonate with the public, while five-term political veteran Chun, once a member of the largest opposition camp, is attempting to use his popularity to sway voters away from his old party. The latest polls show that the approval rating of the veteran politician is double that of the newcomer. But the public sentiment is sharply divided over whether to embrace change with the liberal parties or opt to support a traditional favorite. 
My heart is with the local pig, the Minju Party. Only an experienced politician would know what they do in that seat. With the candidates in nip and tuck matches in several regions, the clock is ticking for voters to make up their minds as the first round of early voting for the April 13th election will take place on Friday. Shin Se-min, Arirang News, Daegu. Now, South Korea, the United States and Japan are planning to hold vice ministerial talks in Seoul before the end of the month. Officials say Seoul's vice foreign minister, Im Sung-nam, and his Japanese and American counterparts, Akitaka Saiki and Tony Blinken, are expected to attend. Talks between the three countries come three months after the meeting in January, after North Korea conducted its fourth nuclear test. The main agenda will be on the adoption of the latest UN Security Council resolution, implementation of their own unilateral sanctions on North Korea, and on sending a powerful message to stop Pyongyang from making further nuclear and missile threats. Now, the UN Security Council adopted its toughest ever sanctions against North Korea around one month ago, and the regime has used the occasion to slam the international measures, calling them unjustifiable. The North state-run Korean Central News Agency reports that the country's National Defense Commission said the UN sanctions merely serve to make North Korea even stronger and more self-dependent. The commission's statement also criticized the ongoing South Korea-U.S. joint military exercises and urged the U.S. to come up with a solution to ease tension on the Korean Peninsula, the perceived tension. It said relations could be improved through negotiations instead of sanctions and military threats. And North Korea's abysmal human rights record is back under the spotlight. A Seoul-based UN office has kicked off its own probe into the alleged abuses carried out in the country that include murder, torture and mass imprisonment. Kim mo reports. The UN Human Rights Office in Seoul has already begun its investigation into human rights abuses in North Korea. Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency reports that the UN office has been holding interviews with a group of North Korean defectors since February. The group were selected from Hanawon, a government-run settlement support center for North Korean refugees. Last month, Marzuki Daruzman, the UN Special Rapporteur on North Korea's human rights, said international criminal law holds military and civilian leaders responsible for failing to prevent crimes against humanity by those under their authority. He reaffirmed that efforts to look into the human rights situation in North Korea will continue until those responsible face justice. The latest move is part of international efforts to put greater pressure on North Korea on top of the already heavy UN sanctions following the regime's nuclear and missile provocations earlier this year. Kim mo Arirang News. Now, the recent rally in global oil prices is losing steam with concerns growing over major producers will be able to agree on a production freeze during an upcoming high-stakes meeting. Uh, Hwang Jie has the details. The oil price surge seen last month was short-lived after it tumbled 4 percent on Friday. The West Texas Intermediate crude fell below the $40 mark to $36.8 a barrel on the New York Mercantile Exchange, marking the lowest settlement since mid-March. The fall came as the comments of Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia fueled concerns of major oil producers failing to agree on restraining output during a meeting between OPEC and non-OPEC members on April 17th. Mohammed bin Salman has said that his country will freeze output only if Iran and other major producers do so. While Iran is expected to attend the talks, Bloomberg has reported that the country is unlikely to join a production freeze as it gears up to sell more of its oil now that sanctions against the country's nuclear program have been lifted. Market analysts are keeping a close eye on the talks later this month that they say will decide whether oil prices surge to over $40 a barrel or plunge deeper. They say if major producers agree on a production freeze this time and also hint on an additional cut in oil output, prices will rise. Every member of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries apart from Libya and Russia will gather in Toha for the meeting. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. 
Now, Korea's stock trading volume keeps plunging this year as investors remain hesitant given the ongoing uncertainties at home and abroad. According to the Korea Exchange on Monday, the average daily trading volume of the benchmark KOSPI and the secondary tech-heavy KOSDAQ in the first three months of 2016 was about 6.9 billion US dollars. This is down over 140 million dollars from the previous quarter. And compared to last July when trading was most active, the daily trading volume was nearly 30 percent down. Investors have been tentative since the second half of last year due to uncertainties around China's stock market and the U.S. Federal Reserve's next move on interest rates. However, the Korean won soared over 8 percent against the U.S. dollar in March, the highest among major Asian currencies as the Fed's stance on rates fueled demand for riskier assets. The growth rate of mortgage loans in Korea slowed significantly in the first quarter this year compared to a year ago. The accumulated amount of mortgage loans granted by six local banks, including Gungmin and Shinan, stood at roughly 300 billion US dollars as of the end of March, up around 3.7 billion dollars from the end of last year. The increase in the first quarter is far lower, though, than the six and a half billion dollars it rose by in the first quarter of 2015. The slower pace of growth comes on the back of the government's stricter guidelines on lending requirements, coupled with sluggish home transactions. A new report shows Korean tech giant Samsung Electronics held a staggering 68% share of the global curved monitor market in the fourth quarter of last year. According to industry tracker Witsview, Samsung dominated the segment in the October to December period, leaving second place HKC trailing in its wake with just 14%. Korea's LG Electronics had about a 4% market share over the cited period. The industry tracker says global shipments of curved monitors reached 900,000 units last year, a figure expected to double this year. It added that demand for curved monitors has been especially high from internet cafes in China due to the product's unique design. And that's pretty much all we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you, as always, for watching. Just a reminder, our new news show, News Break, is coming up at 3 p.m. Korea time, hosted by our very own Han Dayan. Uh, do look forward to that, and we'll be back with that and many more newscasts, of course, throughout the day. So until then, goodbye.